This sermon is brought to you by Christ Church South Philadelphia, a church that is committed to living out the gospel in their neighborhood and from there impacting the world. For more information about our church or to support our mission, you can go to www.christchurchsouthphilly.org. We're going to be in Esther chapter 2 today, picking up in verses 19 and reading down through chapter 3, verse 11. And as you find your way to Esther chapter 2, verse 19, I want to begin by telling you a story about a little girl on her way to school. This little girl is in first grade, and she's excited for the year ahead. She gets up very early and eagerly puts on her clothes. She had a new dress all picked out because today was the day when she was going to a new school, and she wanted it to be something special. She eats her breakfast very carefully, making sure to get nothing on this new dress. She gets her little backpack ready and then walks out the door. All this is a very ordinary thing for a first grader to do. But this is no ordinary day. This is November 14th, 1960, and the little girl I'm telling you about is Ruby Bridges. That day as that little girl walked to her school, mobs of angry white people gathered to scream at her as she bravely walked into William France School and changed American history. Death threats would soon come. Her parents would have to move to another state. Trouble, struggle, and strife followed young Ruby wherever she went. On the 60th anniversary of that fateful day, which was celebrated only two years ago, Ruby was asked why her family chose to send her to that school and to undergo all that they had to undergo as a result. And this is what she said. I think my parents were sick and tired of being sick and tired. You can only give in so much until you have to decide that enough is enough and somebody has to have the courage to make a stand. How much bravery that six-year-old and her parents must have had. What strength it must have taken to make a stand even in the midst of such fierce opposition. As we come to our text this morning, we're going to see a man named Mordecai making a stand. So far in this book, he has not been shown in a very favorable light. He is someone who has tried to actually keep a low, file, low, low profile. He's someone who has purposely tried to blend into his culture and not make any waves. But sometimes enough is enough. Sometimes the moment comes when you have to make a stand. The question I would like us to consider this morning as we make our way through this portion of Scripture is this. When it comes to your faith, are you willing to make a stand? Let's turn our attention to God's Word, starting in verse 19 of chapter 2, reading through chapter 3, verse 11. Now when the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther had not made known her kindred or her people, as Mordecai had commanded her, for Esther obeyed Mordecai, just as when she was brought up by him. In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bithan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on king Ahasuerus. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther. And Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai, when the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows, and it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamed Atha, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, the king had so commanded concerned him. But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day, and he would not listen to them, they told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. For he had told them, that he was a Jew. 
And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as they made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pur. That is, they cast lots before Haman, day after day. And they cast it month after month, till the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples and all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people. and They do not keep the king's laws. So it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. If it please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 pounds of silver into the hands of those who are in charge of the king's business, that they may put it into the king's treasuries. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman the Agagite, the son of Haman the Atha, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, the money is given to you, the people also, to do with them as it seems good to you. May God bless the reading and now the preaching of his word. Would you bow your heads with me in a word of prayer? God, we come to you having read a historical event from several thousand years ago. And yet it is an event that bears much relevance to our life today. And I pray now by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would make these words which you created by orchestrating history and you preserve for us throughout history to read together this morning, I pray that these words would come alive to our hearts and we would hear you speaking to us. God, we want to invite you into this space and we want to say, please come, have your way. Meet us as we are, but please do not leave us as we are. Help us continue to grow and change more and more into the people you've created us to be in Christ. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I've been told this morning's sermon, when it is time to make a stand. When it is time to make a stand. And there are three things that we're going to see as we make our way through this text. We're going to see the reason for making a stand. We're going to see the cost of making a stand. And finally, we're going to see the promise in making a stand. First, the reason for making a stand. Mordecai was not looking for trouble. We saw last week how he had actually become very assimilated into the Persian culture. He had purposely hidden the fact that he was a Jew, and he had told Esther to do the same. He was not looking to be a revolutionary. He was not looking to be someone who makes any kinds of waves. And in fact, we see in chapter 2, it sets an important context in that Mordecai was actually a very good citizen of the kingdom. He, he he, He was looking out for the king's best interests. So when the assassination plot came and he heard of it, right? he wasn't trying to overthrow the kingdom of Persia. He wasn't trying to do anything. He, he just said, hey, listen, he, he told that to the king so that the king's honor, so that the king's life would be spared. He, he honored the king. He took action to, to save the king's life. But then the day came when the king promoted a man named Haman. And he made a decree that everyone Haman passed was supposed to bow down to him. Now, it's important that we understand, this is not a situation, if you're familiar with the Bible, you might be thinking of other stories where people were told down to, told about down to things. Maybe Daniel chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar makes a big statue, tells people to bow down and worship it. That is not what's happening here. Uh, the decree to bow down to Haman has nothing to do with revering him as a god. This was a sign of respect that you were to pay to any noble who was going about in the, in the kingdom in that day. It would be very similar to us if we were beckoned to go to the Buckingham Palace and met the Queen, we would have to give a sign of respect. We're not worshiping her, we're respecting her position, right? And so we would would bow. That's what is being decreed here. There's nothing about worship, he's just saying you need to respect Haman. And again, Mordecai has obviously no problem respecting, as we all should, the authorities and, and figures that God puts in place. But he refuses to bow to Haman. He has no problem respecting authority, but he will not respect Haman's authority. He will not bow before him. Why? 
Well, did you notice it said that it was not just Haman, but it was Haman the Agagite. There are no random words in the Bible. And so it was not by chance that we are told that Haman is an Agagite. That should take us back to 1 Samuel chapter 15. As we see what it means to be an Agagite. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, we see God give a command to the Jewish king Saul to wipe out an evil nation called the Amalekites. God wanted them all gone. Total destruction. And everyone's reading that. Can we take that down for a second until I get there? That's okay. So people keep listening to me. Um, I got to set up before we start reading it. Um, God wanted them all gone. Total destruction. Because they'd opposed God and were spreading evil. They, they did things. This nation, like, like child sacrifices. Horrible, horrible people. And so God told King Saul to take them out and to leave no survivors. But this is what King Saul does. Now we can go ahead and display the, the verse. But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatted calves, and the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. So how King Saul decides to apply God's command to destroy the Amalekite peoples, he goes, well, I'm going to destroy the weak people and the worthless people, the things that won't do anything for me. But the good stuff, I'm going to keep for myself, including the powerful king Agag. Because if you had a king, guess what you could get for a king? You get a king's ransom. Kings were worth a lot of money. They're worth a lot more alive than they were dead. And so Saul spares King Agag's life. And the Milkite nation became known as the Agagites after King Agag. Because of King Saul's sin, they continue to exist and perpetuate their evil. Because of that, if actually you read in the rest of Scripture, you'll see that the word Agagites becomes synonymous actually with evil. These, these, are, these, are, these are sinful people. And so here is Mordecai, who, as we saw in chapter 2, verse 5, he's not only identified as a Jew, but remember, we're told what tribe he comes from. He comes from the tribe of Benjamin, which is the tribe of King Saul. Here's Mordecai watching this evil person who shouldn't even exist. But because Mordecai's past ancestors didn't make a stand here is Haman coming down the street Mordecai is watching this living breathing embodiment of sin and he's seeing everyone else bow and while so far Mordecai has been willing to do anything for Persia he just can't do that Mordecai does not bow Mordecai stands Theologian Ian Duguid summarizes it this way when he says, So for Mordecai, whose genealogy links him to King Saul's family, to bow to Haman, a descendant of King Agag's family, was too much to swallow. It would have seemed to be giving in to a hated enemy whom God had cursed. Bowing to King Ahasuerus, the pagan authority set over God's people on account of their sin, was one thing. Bowing to Haman was another thing altogether. Mordecai couldn't bow. Perhaps he finally saw that going along with the culture only leads to more and more compromise with nothing to be gained. Did, did you notice in chapter 2, he, he saves the king's life and then nothing gets done for him? We're going to see later on in the book how that's setting something up. But like, you, you read that in chapter 2 and it's like, oh, it was recorded in the presence of the king. And then the king promotes, not Mordecai, nothing gets done for him. The king promotes Haman. Perhaps Mordecai finally realized that you go along with the culture thinking that eventually the culture will be okay with you and actually the culture has nothing for you. Evil seems to be winning. And Mordecai seems to be saying enough is enough. Notice he is not only standing But for the first time in this book, he actually makes known his identity. Because he says in verse 4 that he tells these people who are asking him, Haman doesn't see that he's doing his thing. It's his friends that notice what's going on. And they say, hey, why aren't you bowing? They didn't know Mordecai was a Jew because he had kept his faith private. But in that moment, he's going public and he's saying, I can't do that because this is who I am and this is what I believe. 
No longer is he hiding his identity, but he's coming out as a Jewish person and making a stand for his faith. See, when presented with the choice to bow down to a sin that the rest of the crowd was celebrating or to obey God, Mordecai chose to make a stand. Are you willing to make a stand? When there's something that the Bible clearly says is sinful, but the culture celebrates as wonderful, do you bow down to the culture's values, or are you willing to make a stand? Now listen to me carefully. As we do, we must be people who are compassionate and loving towards sinners. Because we are sinners, and God treats us with compassion and love in Christ. There's no room for Christians to arrogantly make a stand with self-righteousness, acting like we are better than. Because the cross of Jesus Christ says that we are all sinners who have been shown mercy by God. And so, for people who believe that we have received mercy from God, you know what we should be filled with? A lot of mercy for other people. We should have compassion for sinners. But for compassion for sinners does not mean compromising the convictions God tells us to hold about the sinfulness of sin. I can be compassionate for a person who is dying from a disease, but is not loving at all to deny the reality of the disease that is wrecking havoc on their lives. In the same way, we can be compassionate for someone who is struggling with sin. But true compassion should never lead us to deny the sinfulness of their sin, which is wrecking havoc on their souls. And there are so many sinful things that our culture celebrates. We don't have Hamans coming down the street that we're expected to bow down to. But oh, there are things we're expected to bow down to, aren't there? There are things that we're expected to affirm. And if we don't, oh, we will feel we will certainly feel some wrath. And so when it comes to popular culture, or maybe your own feelings and desires, when it comes to that, and they are in contradiction with the Bible, what God says, what rules you in that moment? Are you willing to make a stand? I have to continually ask that question to myself. Are we willing to make a stand, for example, with what the Bible talks about sexual ethics? Or will we affirm and maybe even practice things the Bible calls are sinful, but our culture says we must view as wonderful? Will we make a stand on the value of being made in God's image and promote equity for ethnic minorities, or will we deny that things like systemic racism exist? Let's turn a blind eye. Will we make a stand on the value of women, or will we perpetuate their objectification through the use of pornography and reinforce cultural stereotypes that promote inequality? Will we make a stand for the right of every person to be able to live? And will we speak up for the vulnerable, unborn child? Or will we be silent as their lives continue to be taken? I was just at a rally yesterday. Something near 60 million children taken in the most vulnerable state. We're supposed to be silent. Listen, listen. As Christians, we have a choice to be silent or we have a choice to make a stand. Are we willing to make a stand? There can be a sentiment that we shouldn't talk about controversial things because that will just turn people off to Jesus. We need to talk about Jesus, talk about his love, stay away from any of these other things. And I, I can understand that sentiment because I, I certainly think many Christians can talk about cultural topics with a, the way that lacks a lot of charity and grace. We need to understand Jesus never chose between love and between speaking the truth in love even when it came to controversial things in his day. And so we looked at this in Matthew 18 several months ago, for example, when he spoke against his culture of sexual immorality. And he said that sex is a gift created by God to be enjoyed only in the covenant of marriage between one man and one woman. And, and as he said that, even his own disciples were like, whoa, Jesus, that is too hard. You got to tone that message down. But God loves us too much to not be honest with us. He does not arbitrarily define what sin is, 
but out of love, he warns us against things that will do harm to our souls. And so, friends, we cannot be scared of controversy when eternity is at stake. Jesus wasn't. Are we willing to make a stand? I think of the words of the great reformer Martin Luther, who said this, If I profess with the loudest voice and clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God, except that little point, which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I'm not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing Christ. Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. And to be steady on all the battlefield besides is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that point. Significant words coming from a man who lived constantly under the threat of death because he made a stand on saying that salvation is by Jesus alone, through faith alone. And he didn't care what the Pope had to say about it. He made a stand on the points of truth that his culture most hotly pressed against and the whole force of religious powers came against. He made a stand because making a stand for Jesus is not in all the areas where it's easy to do it. It's where the battle rages most that our loyalty is most truly pressed. And truly tested. Are are, are we willing to make a stand? Well, before we answer that question, we need to understand that there's always a cost that comes to making a stand. There's always a cost that comes to making a stand. Point number two, the cost of making a stand. Notice that it's not Haman who notices Mordecai making a stand. Verse 4 tells us that it's the other servants who went and told on Mordecai. Mordecai gets ratted out by his co-workers. In other words, he gets rat out by the other people who were bowing down. You see, people do not like when you do not affirm their choices. No one had a problem with Mordecai when he was hiding that he was a Jew. People are fine with what you believe as long as you keep it private to yourself. But once Mordecai's faith in Yahweh meant that he had to make a stand, now they had a problem with Mordecai. And so they go and tell Haman. And the people's problem with Mordecai becomes something very dangerous for Mordecai and dangerous for all the Jewish people. Because Haman responds by not just wanting to kill Mordecai. Haman responds by wanting to take them all out. See, Haman's actually very shrewd. He recognizes that Mordecai was saying he was making a stand because he was a Jew. In other words, he was making a stand because of the faith that he had. And so Haman understands that This isn't just about Mordecai. But as other Jews start to see what Mordecai is doing, this is going to spread. And so i got to take out everyone. I can't just take out Mordecai. I have to take out everyone who shares Mordecai's worldview. So he goes to the king. He offers him a bunch of money to go annihilate the Jews. He says in verse 9, To please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed. And I'll pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charged the king's business that may be put into the king's treasuries. This is, this is political lobbying at its most insidious. Just buying the king off. And the king, without taking time to verify anything, he just goes along with it. Do you notice that? He gives no thought. He's like, oh, you're going to give me some money? Oh, yeah, sure, I'll make that into law. He gives him a signet ring, which means it's a law that that could not be repealed. That's going to be really important in the story later. But he uses his power to make a law without even considering its implications. What a dumb king. Before we are too hard on him, though, I do need to say this as an aside. We have to consider in our country where we have the power to vote on laws and lawmakers, how often do we engage in using our power without really giving much thought to it? This is not the point of my sermon today, but it's important to recognize that we have power power to influence the laws of our land, and we should not abdicate that responsibility by not voting, and we, we should vote, and we should be informed about how we vote and use that power wisely. We might disagree about who to vote on, that's fine, but the one thing that we should not do is do what King Ahasuerus did and not even think about it and just go down a party line. No, 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 we have a power that we need to take very carefully. And we need to be formed, and we need to think about who we're voting for. It's very important. 
nothing to do with the sermon today, but it's an important thing for this text. But notice that, that Haman point, pay, he pays off the king, and, and he justifies his campaign against the Jewish people. How does he do it? He does it by saying, all these people are disobeying your laws. Now, is that accurate to this point? No. There is nothing so far in this book that shows that the Jewish people are unwilling to obey the king's laws. In fact, last week we saw Esther was more than happy. She should have stood up. She shouldn't have gone to be in the harem of the king. But she was more than happy. Oh, king, you told me to do it? Sure, I'll go ahead and do it. She, she was more than happy to go be with him. There, there, was no, there was no standing up to anything. There was, no, there was no Jewish rebellion and uprising going on. Not whatsoever. They have totally assimilated into the Persian culture. To the point that people didn't even know who, who, who wasn't a Jew. The only thing that's happened is that Mordecai made a stand against Haman. That, that, that's, that's the only kind of transgression of the law that's occurred, which would have been considered a very minor offense. But that's not what Haman says. Haman doesn't say, this guy won't bow to me. So did the king be like, well, get over yourself. Like, he says, oh, it's these can't, do you see what they're going to do? And it's going to be this threat to you. Like, he, he misrepresents them, and it's his misrepresentation of them that justifies the mistreatment of them. If you study history, you'll, you'll, you'll see that most often, oppressions of people group are first justified by misrepresent, misrepresenting that people group. And so the African slave trade was justified by viewing Africans as subhuman. And Hitler justified his quest to exterminate the Jews by saying they were an inferior race. Misrepresentation often leads to mistreatment. I think in our own city, how recently there was a group of teenage girls, three girls between the ages of 14 and 17, who went to pray outside of Planned Parenthood Center. They were just letting the women who were going in, hey, we know you, we love you, God loves you, we'd love to pray for you. They didn't have any signs or anything, they were very peaceful being there, an expression of incredible love. And one of our state representatives goes over to them. You can watch this on Twitter, but only if you have a strong stomach. He goes over to these young girls and begins to berate them as bigoted and sexist and just goes on and on and on, like scaring them. It was unbelievable. He then offers on video $100 to anyone who can dox these girls, anyone who can out them, find out who they are and what they are, so you can go to their homes and further harass them. I don't, yeah. I don't know how it's even legal to do for a 14-year-old. But he's still in office. People are still voting for him. He justifies his terrible mistreatment by representing what they were doing, saying they were doing hateful things. No, they weren't. When did prayer become hate? We, he was able to misrepresent them, and because he misrepresent them, he was able to mistreat them. Listen, friends, that's just what we should expect. If you go against the popular opinion of the culture, this is what we should expect. We should expect to be misrepresented and mistreated. I used to be the president of my neighborhood civic association um, until the pastoral team decided that I needed to make sure to live to the age of 50, and so I needed to start changing some things in my schedule. I'm uh, very grateful for how those guys look out for me because I would burn myself to the ground really fast. So, but, but I did that for, 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 for about a year. In the first meeting after being elected president, someone showed up with quotes from my sermons just to harass and heckle me and tell, tell everyone who was at this meeting how horrible a person I was, right? I've had my tires slashed. People have said all kinds of mean-spirited and slanderous things to me. I even had death threat one time, which wasn't really that real, but like, you know, someone dropped a note in my mailbox and whatever, we had to get the police involved. The reality is, my, my persecution, though, is in our persecution, my persecution is, not, is nothing serious. I don't bring that up to draw attention to myself, but just to say it's something that happens. But it's nothing that serious, especially when you consider what these Jewish people are facing here in Esther chapter 3. Especially when we consider what our, many of our brothers and sisters are facing around the world. Forbes magazine released a report recently that one in eight Christians live in a part of the world where they're in danger of death just for being a Christian. One in eight Christians. This is what they say in that article. On average, every day, every day, 13 Christians are killed for their faith. 12 churches or Christian buildings are attacked. 12 Christians are unjustly arrested, detained, or imprisoned. And five Christians are abducted for faith-related reasons. 
every, every day. This is not just an Esther 3 problem. Persecution is very real for our brothers and sisters around the world. Because there's a cost to standing up for Jesus. And for many years here in America, if we're honest, there's not been much of a cost for us to be Christians. I mean, maybe some people will do what they did to me and say some unkind things and do some unkind things to you. But there, there hasn't been much of a cost. Things have been relatively safe. But there is a rising anti-Christian sentiment that I think we need to be aware of. And I'll be honest, I'm not sure if the American church is ready for it. I'll be honest with you, I, we, don't, we don't seem to be. Because every day it seems that there's another Christian who's denying things of like the authority of Scripture. Well, the Bible's just full of allegory. Like, you know, we don't really should. And they just start, they start mushing it around to mean whatever they want it to mean. They start re-examining their beliefs about sin and Jesus' death on the cross. I'll be honest with you, in the face of persecution, it seems that a whole lot of Christians are fleeing to compromise. Because it's easier to bow down to what everyone else is bowing down to than to stand up and stand out. But friends, we cannot forget the words of our Lord Jesus. We said this in John chapter 15. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecute me, they will also persecute you. As we heard read this morning, the first part of it. John chapter 16 verse 33. In the world you will have trouble. This is Jesus speaking. Listen, I, I praise God that for years our country has been a safe place to be a Christian. But we need to understand that's an anomaly of history and not one that the Bible should, ex, tells us to expect. No, actually, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 says this. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, notice that all, it's a, that's a universal, exhaustive statement, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Listen, I'm not saying this to try to scare anyone, but it's my responsibility, I think, as your pastor to prepare you, to be ready for this. Like, I can't give you the Joel Osteen message of this is about your best life now, because that's not biblical. God promises our best life later with him in heaven, but in this world, well, all who desire to live a godly life will be persecuted, the word tells us. Makes me wonder if you've never been persecuted for your faith, maybe perhaps there's ways you're not living out your faith as you should. If all who desire to live a godly life will be persecuted, and you're not being persecuted, maybe you're not desiring to live a godly life in certain ways. It's a question I've had to reflect on. Persecution is to be expected. There's a cost if you make a stand. But friends, there's a promise that makes it all worth it. Let's look at point number three. The promise in making a stand. The promise in making a stand. We're not told what Mordecai was thinking as he made the stand. We're told that he knew that he was a Jew and he knew he had to believe in Yahweh. Um, but I wonder if perhaps he was starting to hold on to some of the promises that God made to his Jewish people. Perhaps he was thinking about Psalm chapter 20. Where the promise of God is given, now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving might of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of our Lord God. Or perhaps he was thinking about Psalm chapter 91. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Listen, friends, I'm not sure on what promises of God Mordecai stood. But I do know the promises of God on which we can stand. Because as we read Psalm 20, we know that God does save his anointed. Because Jesus Christ is the anointed one of God. That's what the word Christ means. It's a Greek translation of the Hebrew word anointed. Jesus is the anointed one who was saved from abandonment to the grave as God brought him back to life after three days of being dead. You see, we can look back at Psalm 91 and know that Jesus is the one who held fast to God in love. And Jesus was delivered from the tomb. 
See, Mordecai could have looked forward with faith and made his stand on the promise of the coming Messiah, but we look back and we make our stand on knowing that the Messiah has come. We look back with faith and we make our stand on Jesus and the promise of who he is for us. Friends, our takeaway from this text is not that we should just learn to stand up like Mordecai. No, what we should be seeing in this text is that in Mordecai, we are seeing the foreshadowing of Jesus, the one who has come and who has stood for us. What did Jesus do in the face of evil? Well, he's the one who may have stand for us in the desert when Satan tried to get him to bow down to sin. Jesus stood and would not give in. He, he did not become like the first Adam who failed to Satan's temptation in the garden. No, Jesus is the better second Adam who stands up against Satan's temptation and wins in the desert. When Jesus was brought before the Sanhedrin and his life was on the line, he stood for us when they asked him, are you the Messiah? He didn't take a way out and get himself off the hook. No, he said, I am. And, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. That's the statement that gets him condemned to death. And then Jesus goes and he stands for us before the Roman governor Pilate. who says, why are you standing here? Don't you know that I have power to take your life? Jesus says, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. And this is referring back to the authority Jesus says he has in John chapter 10. I have authority to lay my life down and I have authority to take it back up again. Friends, Jesus stood for us. It's all of God's wrath. God's righteous judgment for our sins. All of God's wrath that would have been stored up from the beginning of time. All of God's righteous judgment that would take us in eternity to experience in hell. Jesus stood for us as he hung on the cross and refused to get down. No matter how much the crowds mocked him, no matter how much his enemies taunted him, no matter how desperate he became, even as he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus continued to hang because he was making his stand for us until all our sins had been paid for and he could say, it is finished. So friends, how we find the strength to stand when the culture is calling us to bow, how we can find the strength to stand, no matter the cost that comes our way, how we can find the strength to stand is by doing what Hebrews 12 tells us. We consider Him who endured from sinners such hostility against Himself so we might not grow weary or faint. How do we not to grow weary or faint-hearted? We're getting canceled. We're getting passed over in promotions. We're losing our jobs. Family members won't speak to us. How do we not grow weary and faint-hearted? It's not by selling out and compromising and making our lives easier. How we don't grow weary and faint-hearted is by considering him who endured such hostility against himself. God does not ask us to find the strength to stand within ourselves. He asks us to look to Jesus. The promise of all who Jesus is for us. Because Jesus has stood for us, we can know that when our days of persecution comes, 2 Timothy 4.18, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. Because of Jesus, we, can, we know the promise is true. In Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Because of Jesus, we know the promise is true. In Romans 8, 28, for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Because of Jesus, we know the promise is true. In 1 Peter 1, 4 through 5, we have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by his, God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, right through revealed at last for Friends, God has made us precious promises. And each one of those promises finds their yes in Jesus. God never promised us an easy life. 
But he did promise us that he will keep us in Jesus for eternal life. And it's the promise of Jesus that makes it worth taking a stand for Jesus. No matter the cost to us. I think the big idea of this text could be summarized this way. We can stand up for Jesus by standing on the promise of Jesus. When your moments come, teenagers, when your moments come in your classroom, there's a conversation happening amongst your friend group. You have a choice to be silent or to make a stand. We can stand up for Jesus by standing on the promise of Jesus. We don't stand on life being easy. We don't stand on everything going our way. We don't stand on popularity. We stand on knowing that there is nothing that's worth more than Jesus Christ and eternal life for Him. We can stand up for Jesus by standing on the promise of Jesus. Listen, Christ Church, I, I don't know what the days are ahead for us. I don't know what some of you might even be facing right now. But I do know that when your day of persecution comes, and it will surely come, and you have to ask yourself a question, am I willing to stand up for my faith? Friends, the courage to stand up for Jesus comes from standing on the promise of Jesus. We can stand up for Jesus not by, believe, not by trying to be strong, but by believing that he is strong. and He will keep all of his promises to us. And so my prayer is that this is what God would find us doing. He would find us as a church making our stand. No matter what comes against us, he would find us making our stand on the truth of who he is with arms outstretched in love to a lost and dying world. Jesus would find us making a stand with compassionate hearts and uncompromising convictions. He would find us making a stand until he returns or until he calls us home. Let's bow our heads in prayer.